nights she pays the flow. Praying I would make it home all right. Believing God that He will someday save my soul. Well, He did. And I thought you'd like to know. Mm -hmm. I thought you'd like to know all those prayers you prayed for me. God answered your prayers, and I thought you liked to know. If I could, I would surely make a mess. Oh, but if I can help my brother a new life to discover, oh, I will. And I thought you'd like to know.
When you get that same man. Amen. Amen. Second Kings. Yes. Let me go ahead and turn to chapter four. You get to chapter four. Go to verse 16. I'm going to read a few verses, but I don't want y'all to be discouraged. I was, I was studying this week. I was again reminded. I knew it, but I was reminded of the fact that when Jesus preached, he sat down. The people stood up while he preached. So I used to apologize for y'all having to stand while I read a lot of scriptures. But just stand and then y'all could be seated. I'm going to stand for the body, man. In other words, y'all ain't got to stand that long. 16, verse 16. If you're there, say amen. amen. And we're going to read some verses for context so that we may fully grasp this lesson and it may be empowered to our lives. We may apply it to our living. Chapter 4, verse 16. And he said about this season, According to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. Verse 17 says, And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, According to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Now this is why it gets good. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Now look at verse 22, this is where it gets interesting. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And look at his response. And he said, Wherefore would I go to him today? Is it neither new moon nor Sabbath? And she said, It's going to be all right. That's what I hear her say. Then she sat on the ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slap not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went up and came into the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. And said to her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? Verse 26 says, And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God says, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy Lord, and take my staff in thy hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, don't even talk to him. And if any man say something, you don't talk to him. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child, look what it says, was dead and laid upon his bed. But he went in anyway and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. He stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. And then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Verse 26 says it all. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was coming into him, he said, Take up thy son. Turn to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, this is the example of a mother 
the challenge to the church in experiencing the power of God. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. You may be seated. I read a study recently in regards to the benefits of parents to in the life of a child. Uh, and it was interesting to note that for the father, there were only a couple of things that the Bible, that the, the, the reading said, this wasn't the Bible, this is just a book I read, said the benefits to a child. There was a few important things, but just a few things in regards to the benefit of a child in the presence of their father. Uh, but the benefits of having a mother in the life of a child was infinite because uh, the mother not only was the giver of life to this child, but the mother also, because of the nutrients in her body, was able to sustain and is able to sustain a child without anyone else's assistance. Let me say it again. The mother, and only the mother, can sustain a child with what's in her body as a result of what God put there all by herself. In other words, the mother really don't need the grocery store right off the bat because God has already placed in the mother what's needed to sustain a child. But likewise, it said that a child that has a good mother, or a mother that is involved, and also has the ability emotionally to deal with circumstances and situations in a very healthy way. In other words, if a, child, a child that has a mother in their lives is able to be calm in times of stress, is able to deal with certain situations are better than those who may not have had a mother present. And as I looked at that, I began to realize that the mother, the benefit, the role of the mother was great uh, psychologically, it's great emotionally, and it's also great uh, biologically. But I began to realize, for those of us who are here today, we may also testify that having a mother in our lives is also a benefit to us spiritually. Do I have a witness on that? It, not only does having a mother benefit you uh, biologically, not only does it benefit you emotionally and psychologically, but having a mother can also benefit you spiritually. Let me raise my hand if nobody else does. If, if having a mother has blessed your life in a spiritual way, you ought to just wave your hand. If, if, as the song saying, if your mother prayed for you, you ought to raise your hand. If your mother talked to you and gave you some insight, you ought to raise your hand. But what I began to reflect on was not only was the mother beneficial for prayer and also beneficial for sharing the scripture, but oftentimes the mother is beneficial because of an example that they live, they give, they give to their children. In other words, sometimes it ain't so much what mama said or what mama uh, talked about or what songs she sang or what scripture she read, but it was how she lived that caused us to know how to live for the Lord. In other words, the real Christian woman is outlined in the book of Proverbs. The real woman of God is able to walk and walk and cause folk to see her and want to walk the same walk. Well, in our text for today, we see an example of a woman uh, who, as a result of her reverence and love for God, became an example to the church of how we ought to live for God and likewise how we can experience the power of God in our lives. The first thing I want us to understand is this woman's story did not begin when she had the child, but it began earlier in chapter 4. For the Bible says that this was a woman. Uh, and for whatever reason, the Bible says she was a noted woman because, and I want to be watch this carefully, this twist in the story. She was a woman that had resources. She wasn't a broke woman because early in chapter 4, there was a woman who did not have anything that God gave what she needed. But here is a story of a woman who had stuff and was willing to give the stuff she had to God. Can I talk about this story for a moment, chapter 4? This woman uh, was talking to her husband. And she said, look here, uh, there, that man, that, that man, that prophet that comes back and forth along this way. I, I sense in my spirit that this man is a man of God. Now, I want to be clear. She was not identifying him as a man of God because of his title. She was identifying him as a man of God because of some morality and something that existed on the inside that poured itself on the outside to cause her to realize she was in the presence of somebody who really knew God. Can I tell somebody, it ain't your title that makes you special. It's allowing the God in you to come out that makes you somebody, man, woman, boy, or girl. It's not your title or what you well, it's how you live that causes somebody to know who you really are. I don't, I don't give my title when I go places. I want somebody to know that I love God because I live like I love God. She sent something. Tell your neighbor, she sent something. She said, this, this is a man of God. And, and, and look here, a husband of mine, he 
is a man of God and what we ought to want to do, what we ought to do is since he comes by this way all the time, what we ought to do is set him up a little room so if he want to take some time out on his journeys, he can stop by this room. I wish I, I wish y'all could walk with me on this right here. It, it, we see this man of God as something on the inside of him. We ought to do something special because he is operating in a divine capacity for God. Tell somebody that's, that's what we all ought to want to do. And I'm not talking about a person now. If you're a child of God, you ought to want to make room for God in your life. In other words, she had a big house, but her house was too big that she didn't want some God in her house. If you're a child of God, you might have one bedroom or ten bedrooms, but you ought to want to make some space for God in your life. She made some room, is what I'm trying to say. And, and not, not just any room, she didn't clear out an old room, she built some, a new room. Put a table in there, that's what I like for day. She didn't just put a bed in there, she put a table and a chair in there because she wanted this man to be able to hang out and dwell in her house. If you're a child of God, you ought to want God to stay in your presence. I say, Ooh. You, you ought to make some room for God and not see some of us make room for God in the morning before we go to work and some of us make room for God late in the midnight hour some of us just make room for God when trouble comes but if you are a child of God you ought to make some room for God Monday through Sunday every day 24 hours a day 7 days a week 12 months a year you ought to make some room for God This is an example right here, that's all I'm saying. This is a mother's example. She made made room for God. The part I like is she made this room and they built this room for the man of God, Elisha. And as Elisha began to continue his travels, he would, in fact, stop by this room. He and his servant, God. And so one day, as they were uh, sojourning on their journeys, they uh, habitated this room that was made available to them. This is what looks good. Elijah said to Gehazi, look here, go talk to the woman. Find out that she need anything. Do y'all see that right now? She made room for God. And now, without her having to ask, God is coming to her through Elijah to find out what her heart desires. In, in other words, if you want to hear from God, you ought to make room for God. And you don't have to call God 911. God will call you on the morning and say, well, look here, it's another day. I'm ready for us to get going. What do you need to have a good day? That's what I'm talking about right there. When you make room, when you talk to God all the time, when you always in connection with God, when you got God on the phone and you ain't got to call him up in emergency, God will come to you. Is there anybody here that before you could ask for something, God was already moving? And you're in there, anybody? here. Before you could get down on your knees, God was already speaking to your soul and giving you what you do. You might have been sad, but God was giving you joy for you asked for it. God's going to find out now. He's going to find out what it is that she needs. And the Bible says that Gehazi went to it. She said, and he said, do you need a favor from the king? See, Elisha had a good relationship with the king. She, she said, after this, she need a relationship, a conversation with the king. Does she need, the her husband need a thing? They need any political help. They need a loan from the bank. What? What do they need? Come on. I like her response. She said, I'm just a regular woman. I, I, you know, I don't even need that right there. I stay in my neighborhood. If you read it, that's what she said. I stay among my people. She said, I stay in my neighborhood. I, I don't I don't need nothing from the king. And I ain't doing king stuff. I ain't, I ain't hanging out over there with him. I, yeah, matter of fact, I, I don't want nothing. I'm all right. Now, you know, I had to evaluate this right here because that's an unusual woman. That's an unusual person who gets an opportunity to get a favor from somebody up here and says, I don't need nothing, especially when that person or that somebody is living in your house. Oh, y'all, 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 I look myself in the mirror. I might have had a hard time turning that one down. You, well, what you need, Thomas, hold on for a second. Let me think about what I need. She said, I don't need nothing. But this is what happens when you make room for God in your life. 
This woman had a request from the man of God to say, what you want? And, her, and some humility comes and says, I'm good. But then the next thing is, uh, Gehazi came back and said, well, she says she all right. But Elisha said, but you, what, you, what, you've seen her. Tell me what you think she might need. Do y'all see that right there? She said, I'm all right. Elisha, the man of God, said, well, look here, I'm going to give her something because of the position she's taking toward God. She's going to get something whether she wants it or not. And that's what I want somebody to know. Some of us always walk around counting blessings. And that's why some of us get sad because we're counting blessings. I want somebody to understand right here. If you just focus on God, God will give you more than you ask for. God will give you more than you need. God will give you an overflow if you focus on God. Too many of us are walking around looking for something as opposed to looking at God and getting the overflow in our lives. Stop being a blessing counter and be a God worshiper. Gehazi said, look here, Elisha. She don't have no children. She got a husband. But they have not had any children. And in that economy, that was a problem. Now, it wasn't because, again, they needed anything. Because we learned early in the text, and we had read in the early verse of chapter 4, that they had stuff. They had money, they had resources, but the problem was because they had no children, they had nobody to leave what they had to. So it's one thing to have a problem, you ain't got nothing, and you need somebody to get some for you, but they had some and didn't have nothing to give what they had to. Come on now. said, tell them to come here. Tell them to come here. That's what Elisha said. He said, go ahead, Gehazi, go get it. I got it now, I got it now. Bible says that she comes, she came to. Elisha's room. Look at this. She came to Elisha's room in her house. Yet the text says she would not come into the room because she had reference for whose room it was. In other words, she was not an Indian here, but she didn't say, well, he in my house. She said, this is his room and I'm going to reference it because I've given over to the man of God. In other words, some of us want to give God some praise and then count out what God has done. If you're going to give it to God, let God have it. Y'all can see it now. She comes to the doorway and says, yes, yes, master, yes, my Lord, yes, yes, sir. What can I, what can I do for you? Elisha said, this time, next year, you are going to have a child. Y'all walk with her. She didn't ask for a child, but she had a problem in her heart, a desire for a child. God, through Elisha, heard her heart's desire, not even her prayer request, and has granted what her heart desire was just because she had made room for God in her life. She didn't say, can I have a child? He said, okay, go ahead. You'll have it next year. She came and said, what can I do? And Elijah said, next year, you go have a child. Right. Oh. Oh. Now, I was say this. That this woman because of this situation and sometimes situations can make you sometimes a little concerned, a little cynical. Sometimes, this is just being in this world, sometimes you can get cynical. And that's why it's important for us to stay connected to God. Let me talk about when I say cynical. Some of us can get cynical. In other words, that, that even though we know we serve a powerful God, we can look at every situation and see the worst in it. Do you anybody know about like that? I don't care how good it's going, they can see the bad in it. Oh, you got a raise. Well, I, yeah, I got a raise, but I got more responsibility. Oh, oh, oh you, you get promoted. I got promoted, but I don't feel like dealing with so and so. It's not skipping all over the blessing and getting to the negative part. I, I stopped by St. Peter tell St. Peter folks, stop looking at the bad part and looking at the good part because you serve a good God. Don't get mad when you get a blessing. Give God praise for the breakthrough. She was cynical of this. She said, she, she said, don't, don't play with me. Don't, don't tease me. 
I know I didn't ask for it, but don't, don't tease me. And it made me think about Sarah a little bit because when God told Abraham, Sarah, you about to have a baby, Sarah just laughed. She, she just outright, and, and I believe that her laughter was not that she didn't believe God could do it. Her laughter was because she felt like maybe she had missed out on something else. But what she came to find out that the way God works, God not only controls things, he controls time as well. And so what Sarah found out was she wasn't too old to have a child, but not only that, she wasn't too old to raise a child. Can I, can I do a personal testimony right here? Can I do one, give me one personal testimony moment? When I was a little boy, I asked my mama, I said, why y'all wait so late to have me? That's what I asked her. I said, everybody else, mama, I went to third grade class, and everybody else's parents about 10, 12 years younger than my parents. I said, why y'all wait so late to have me? Everybody younger than y'all. My mama said, well, you know, they said we couldn't have you anyway. I said, well, tell me what that means, mom. She said, well, the doctor said that I wasn't supposed to be able to have children. And I said, well, why am I here? She said, I kept on praying. Can I talk about that for a moment? She had an expectation. I'm talking about my mama. Just one moment. She kept on praying and said, I believe that God can do it. Matter of fact, Mother Phelps can testify. She went to Mother Phelps' daddy and he prayed for my mama. And right after that, well, here's the rest of the story. God can do whatever God wants to do. And we ought not deny what God can do. We ought to trust that God can do everything. I don't care if somebody said no. God can always say Let me do it one more time. I don't care who said no. God can say what? to tell us she'll have a baby this time next year. In the next verse, the Bible says, in this time next year, she had a son. It was important that she, that she, that she had the boy, because now they had somebody to leave their stuff to. But this is where the example gets even better. She had the son, and the son grew up. The Bible says son grew up. Now, now as I read through the history of Second Kings, I want to be clear. At the time of the beginning of this text, according to the historical information, this woman was well into her hundreds, but she lived long enough to see her son become a man. Y'all see it? All right, now don't, don't give up now. So, so now the Bible says the son had grown up and he was working with his daddy who was still alive. So in other words, God may have gave him a baby late, but he gave him a baby in plenty of time for this boy to become a grown man. Y'all ought to be glad about that. In other words, don't, don't say, I ain't got my blessing yet. Just say, whenever God blesses me, it's going to be right on time. You can say, I've been trying to start a business, but I, I believe it's too late. Don't say it's too late, because God can give you time and more time to do whatever he wants you to do. Somebody say, I want to start a career in music. I want to uh, get this job. I want to go back to school. No, that God controls time and he can give you all the time you need. The boy was now a man and he was working in the fields with his dad. And one day the boy as he was working with his dad in verse 19 said my head my head. And I love verse 19 because Daddy said to his servant, get that boy to his mama. The daddy was wrong too now. But he said, if it's going to be really some nurture, he need to go to his mama. If it's going to be somebody that's going to hold him, he needs to be with his mama. There's going to be somebody who wipes the tears from his eyes. It's going to be his mama. It's going to be somebody who's going to stay up all night long with him. And, and even though he coughed and patting him on the back, that's going to be his mama. Take him to his mama. The Bible says they took him there. And she did what a mother does. She put that boy, and I can imagine him, legs. His, she, was, she was in his lap. But her feet, his feet were on the ground. But there was still who? His mom. The Bible says that, that she held him on her knees in her lap. And after a while, about 12 o'clock noon, the boy, he died. But mama didn't give up. And I stopped by here to tell you that's another example that we can get from our mothers. That a real child of God don't never give up. I don't care how dark the night may get. 
we ought not never give up. I, I don't care how, how, how ferocious the storm is. We can't never give up. I don't care what the news report says. We can't never give up. I, I don't care what conventional wisdom says. We can't never give up. Because a lot of folk with a dead son in that lap would have gave up. But mother didn't give up. The Bible says she went to the, her husband and said, look here. For first verse 21 says she got up and took the boy to the man of God's room. Can I pause parenthetically and talk about this room one time? This room was not her room, but it was the man of God's room that she had made room for. In other words, when you make room for God, it's no it surprise that you're going to have to come back to the God that you made room for because he will make room for you. In other words, if she had never made room for this man of God, she would have had to go somewhere else to find where he was. But because she made room, all she had to do was go up the steps. She put, look at verse 1, I'll read it. She put the boy on the bed of the man of God. And then to make sure that then nobody go in there bothering with him, she shut the door. Now I want y'all to read verse 21. She shut the door and left out. She didn't tell nobody else to come in there and watch over him because she know there wouldn't nobody else do nothing. It had to be God involved. Sometimes we get everybody else involved in our circumstance and our situation. But can I tell somebody when you really trust in God, you got to shut the door sometimes. You got to close other folk out. You got to close other things out. You got to close the elements out. You got to keep other stuff out because some stuff is between you and God. She went to her husband. She said, give me one of these servants. Give me one of these asses that I may go fast to the man of God and come back. Husband said, well, why you got to bother him today? Look at verse 24. It ain't a special day. It's not a new moon or a Sabbath. It, it's why, why today? She said, don't worry about it. It's going to be alright. Here's why, here's why that was an interesting conversation. He was saying that in his role as prophet, he would not be willing to entertain her unless it was a festival day. Or, in other words, put it like this in contemporary terms. She was, he was saying to her, his, his wife, why are you bothering him today? It ain't Sunday morning. Or it ain't Wednesday night. Don't send that boy. Don't you go bother the pastor today on Sunday. It ain't Sunday. It ain't Wednesday. Leave him alone. But what he didn't know was it because she had made room for the man of God in her life that he had 24 hour access to the same man of God and I want somebody to know when you make room for God in your life you ain't got to call the pastor you ain't got to deal with office hours you can call on the Lord and the only somebody going to answer the phone is going to be Jesus and he going to say hold for my day I'm never about to finish this now well, the Bible says, she said, it's going to be all right. And the Bible says, she put, got verse 24, she got on her ass and, and said to the servant, go fast as you can and don't slow down until I tell you to. And the Bible says in verse 25, that she went up and came close to the man of God to Mount Carmel. He was up there in worship, having a worship service. But because this woman had made room for the man of God, when the man of God saw this woman, he didn't tell nobody to stop her at the door. Because this woman had made room for the man of God, he didn't send his servants and tell her not to bother me. Because this woman of God had made room for the man of God in her house, Elisha said, Gehazi, go find out is everything all right. And I want somebody to know when you have a relationship with God, you ain't even got to always call and tell them up. You just say, Father, here I am. I need your help and God is ready to move because you made room for him. God came and asked this woman, is everything all right? This woman again used her typical vernacular because all she said in verse 26 is, it is waiting. I want to paint this picture again. Gehazi said, is, is your husband alright? Is your son alright? 
is you are right. But she had a son who was dead at home, yet she said, it is all right. Now I had to do some walking on that one because I had to ask myself, if she knew her son was dead at home, why would she say everything was all right? But then I had to go back to the very beginning of this text. When you are a child of God, when you know you serve a powerful God, when you know you serve a merciful God, when you know you serve an available God, I don't care how dark it look, you already know it's all right. Don't have a job, it's all right. Sick in your body, it's all right. Your mom and daddy go, it's all right. Hub and a wife left you, it's all right. Because God is in control. Second of the pastor, right quick. Too many Christians are complaining all the time when you have access to a God who will make everything all right. Sometimes you gotta say thank you, Lord, even though it ain't all right then, because you know the God you serve can make it all right. It's clear. Somewhere between verses 26 and 27 that a life came to meet this woman. Because in verse 27 it says that she came to the man of God to the hill near Mount Carmel. She bowed down in reverence. I want to be clear, this is not desperation. This is reverence. She bowed down in reverence and grabbed him by the feet, demonstrating that she knew that he had the answer to whatever her query was. A true child of God is not afraid to bow down in the presence of the Lord. A real child of God is not afraid to submit to the authority of God. A true child of God is not able not, and not have a problem with sometimes saying, God, I can't, but I know you can. A real child of God says some tears sometimes of humility, knowing that God is able to do whatever needs to be done. She bowed down. But Gehazi, whose job, so to speak, was not only a licensed assistant, but he was also an editor. He was charged with trying to protect Elisha's time and his energies. Jehazi jumped up trying to do his job. I'm not mad at Jehazi. He was trying to do what he was supposed to do. He came near this woman trying to push her away. But Elisha said, leave her alone. For her soul is fixed and the Lord has not yet revealed to me what her problem is. And I want you to know that when you are trying to get to God, every now and then somebody might try to get in your way. Sometimes they're not being funny, they just don't know what to do. When you're praying all night long and somebody tell you, you ought to get off your knees and get in the bed and get you to sleep. They don't mean no harm, they just don't know what you're trying to do. When you jump up on your feet and give God praise all the time, they say, you ought to take some time out for yourself. You ought to say, don't worry about it, I, I know what God is doing in my life. When somebody trying to tell you to stop going to church all the time because you waste your time at the church, don't worry about them. They, they don't know no better. They don't know that you're trying to draw closer to the Lord. I should leave her, but let, let her get up here where we can find out what's going on. And the Bible said that she came to Elisha. She's about to finish here. And she asked the question, didn't I tell you not to tease you about this son? Didn't I ask you, and, and, and you knew I wanted the son, but didn't I also say, don't play with me? Without asking any further questions, Elisha knew what the problem was. And if I could really walk down a spiritual path, I want you to know I believe Elisha knew when he got there. Because he was serving a true and living God. But he wanted there to be a statement on the record so that people could look back and say, look what God has done. 
Can I tell somebody that's why your testimony is so important? Sometimes you ought not be afraid to say, I've given it over to God and I know that God is going to work it out all right. Because then there's a document or some documentation of what you trusted God with and how God made the difference. Verse 29 says that immediately Elisha gave an order. He says, Gehazi, gird up your loins. Gehazi, get ready and take my staff in thine hand and go back to this woman's house. And if anybody tries to stop you and have a conversation with you, don't you stop. And don't let you, don't let them stop you. He said that when you get to the woman's house, take my staff and lay it upon the face of the child. Elisha gave a prescription to Gehazi to go to do something about this young boy's life being gone. But I love verse 30. Because verse 30 said, and the mother of the child. And I want to be clear, we never got this woman's name. We know she was from a city called Shuma. We know that she had a husband who had a lot of stuff. But all we really know is that she was the mother of this child. And the Bible said, and this woman said, as the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I'm going to stay right here with you. And I want you to understand what happened in this particular moment. All this woman was saying was, sir, I hear you assigning your a servant to go and they and put your staff on my son. But I believe that within you, there's a certainty of my boy being brought back to life. I don't know about what the staff might do. I don't know what your servant might do. But I know if you get there, that everything is going to be all right. And I want somebody to know that's the kind of trust we ought to have in God. Somebody might say one thing and somebody might say something else. But you say, I'm going to hold on to God so I'm changing hand. I'm going to pray as long as I need to pray. I'm going to praise as long as I need to pray. I'm going to sing as long as I need to sing. Because I'm just waiting on the Lord to make a move in my situation. I stopped by St. Peter to tell somebody today, whatever you're going through, just hold on to God. Whatever your situation, just hold on to God. If your children are in trouble, hold on to God. If your grandchildren are in trouble, hold on to God. And God will make a way. Well, somebody said, how you know he'll make a way, brother pastor? How you know he'll make a way? Well, I read the end of the story. The Bible says that as soon as this woman declared her determination to trust in the Lord, the Bible says that a Gehazi kept on running. But when he got there, right behind him was this man Elisha. Now, I don't know how old Elisha was, but I to suggest that he was younger than Gehazi. But what I do know is because of this woman's determination, God, Elisha got there right behind Gehazi. When he got there, Gehazi had a report. He said, look here, Elisha, the child is still dead. And Elisha, the Bible says, came into the house. And he came into the house and recognized that the child was in fact dead. But when he got to the house, he didn't cry about the boy's situation. When he got to the house, he didn't send out a death announcement. When he got to the house, he didn't say call AJC and tell them to print the death of this boy. When he got to the house, he didn't say call the neighbors because it's time for soldiers and fried chicken. When he got to the house, he didn't say call the funeral home, it's time to make arrangements. When he got to the house, he didn't give up. Instead, he got down. The Bible says in verse 32 that instead of giving up, he laid upon the bed. And when he got on the bed, he lined his eyes up with the boy's eyes. He lined his mouth up with the boy's mouth. He lined his hands up with the boy's hands. And he stretched himself out upon the child. And the Bible says that the dead child started warming up. In other words, his body had gotten cold. But because he was doing the work of the Lord, his temperature started coming up. It went from 85.6 to 90.1. It went from 90.1 to 92.5. It went to 92.5 to 94.6. It went from 94.6 to 97.5. This boy, he warmed up. But that wasn't the end 
the story that Elisha got up and he gave him some time to observe what God can do. And sometimes God would give you a pause in the middle of your breakthrough to see what he's doing. And the Bible said Elijah walked one way and he walked another way. He walked from the den to the kitchen. He walked from the kitchen to the dining room. And then he went back upstairs. And when he got back upstairs, he did it one more time. He did it one time so they know it was God. He did it a second time so they trust God. He put himself on this boy and the boy who was dead, the boy who was dead in his boy's room, this boy started to sneeze. In other words, oxygen got to moving. His lungs got to working. His pulmonary system got to pumping. And the same boy that was dead, he got up alive again. To the point where Elisha said, tell that woman who loved her son, but tell that woman who loved the Lord that she can come pick up a bar because everything is all right. Sir. I'm going to my seat, St. Peter, but I want you to know one thing. When you trust in the Lord, he will, he will, he will, he'll make a way. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he on solid ground he is a way maker he is a doctor in a sick room he is a lawyer in a courtroom he is a bridge over troll waters he is a battle axe in a time of battle he is a shelf in a time of storm I don't know about you but I'm going to trust the Lord because I know the Lord will he's been too good he's brought me too far He's made too many ways. He's good. Is there anybody here who knows that God is good? Won't he make a way? 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 Won't he fix it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it?